OK, welcome to day two of the Northeast APMS annual meeting. Um, it is Wednesday at one o'clock. We're going to be doing aquatic pesticide training. I would like to introduce Carlton Lane, a man that probably needs no introduction. But since we're here, uh, Carlton has a BA in biology from Clarion State University in Clarion, Pennsylvania and a MS in criminal justice from Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. Carlton has spent five years as a USDA inspector and, thir and has 30 years of experience with the EPA as a pesticide inspector, state liaison officer, regional and national train center officer, chief investigator, and national pesticide expert. For the past 17 years, he has served as the executive Director of the Aquatic Ecosystem Research Foundation, ARF, and uh, his ARF manual sits on my desk as a pivotal part of all my training. So with that, I'd like to introduce Carlton Lane, and uh, thank you for your time. Carlton? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm um, old, officially old, in case you didn't know that. and. Um, so this Zoom stuff is sometimes challenging for me, so bear with me. And I'm about 18 months behind the woke curve, so I'll just go ahead and apologize right now. If I offend anyone in the next hour, it's certainly not intended, uh, except for Bo, but Bo's not here. I would intentionally offend him if he were. So uh, let me back up. Here's Here's where we are. So uh, this, I'm with AERF and Josh uh, kindly presented um, more of a more of an introduction than than was warranted for this one hour presentation. But I I very much appreciate the invitation to present and uh, also uh, in advance your your attention. And I hope you find some of this stuff uh, helpful. Um, let's see. So, uh, we run into, uh, in the aquatics world, we run into a lot of ignorant people. Um, and ignorance is a, a state of, of being that's curable. Ignorance is only the lack of information. And what I have found in the last couple of years with or I'd say three mostly, with the rise, uh, increasing attention of anti-herbicide folks and anti-algicide folks, is that they're mostly in a state of ignorance. And if we're all about providing them with facts um, and not internet facts, but real facts, uh, then they can come out of that state of ignorance and actually know something. Uh, but even Benjamin Franklin in his time was faced with that contradiction of ignorance and stupidity. You know, John, said, John Wayne said ignorance was curable, but stupid is forever. And that's sort of where Ben Franklin was as well. So the topic today is pretty much herbicide slash algicide. Uh, label compliance or just pesticide label compliance because what I'm telling you applies to uh, all pesticides and please keep in mind pesticides is not the equivalent of um, insecticides you often hear that that well I'm not using a pesticide I'm using a herbicide or I'm using an algicide but a pesticide is the most general term that can be used it's all encompassing it's everything it's disinfectants, it's um, herbicides, algicides, uh, piscicides, avicides, and all the sides that you can think of and, and even includes repellents and, um, and growth regulators, depending on the claims that they make. So the pesticide is the big picture. And uh, I've been saying it since 1975, and it's true, the label is the law. Um, and during the years that I was a pesticide inspector and investigator, I would have thought that in those 30 years, I would have worked myself out of a job, especially with all the training and the meetings and everything that's around there. But 
job security was inherent in what I was doing. And if those that are those that are working in the pesticide industry as enforcement officers or inspectors, uh, you all know what I mean. It's um, it's easy to say the label is the law, uh, but the labels are becoming more complex. Um, and uh, and I think I think there's more attention paid to them these days uh, in depth. So it's really a cautionary tale that if you're working in this industry, you really have to be careful. So it's all based on uh, FIFRA, which is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. That's a very old statute. You know, pesticides have been regulated by the feds since 1910. And the comprehensive FIFRA statute was first passed in 1946. And that started the whole registration process for pesticides. It was amended again in 1972. And this provision was added to Section 12, A, Section 12, and this is A2G, shall be unlawful for any person to use any pesticide in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. And prior to that, uh, especially young folks find it almost uh, inconceivable, but it was not illegal to misuse a pesticide. It was primarily a product uh, regulation statute and a consumer protection statute in that the product had to contain what it said it contained and that uh, it had to do what it said it would do. So uh, since 1972, when the statute was amended substantially, um, EPA and state pesticide investigators have been enforcing this provision. Immediately following in the mid 70s, the whole certification program was put together for pesticide training. And that's sort of what we're doing right now is we're following up on uh, what it takes to be certified. It's not forever. It lasts, depending on the state, three to five years, and you have to take uh, continuing training. So let's see. So if you go to the regulations at 40 CFR and look up use in terms of pesticide use, these are the things you'll see. And all the different directions for use that appear on a pesticide label can be basically filed under each one of these bullet points. <coughs> Excuse me. So down under anything else to protect the public, you may see um, child uh, resistant packaging, you see uh, everything from worker protection, you can see drift, that those items would be in there. And also in that category, you'd see things on the label that the company may choose to put on there to protect their own liability that may or may not have been part of the registration process. The rest of the, the bullets, except for the last one, are all related to requirements that EPA has for registrants, companies that want to register a pesticide for distribution and sale in the United States. All these things have to be added. Uh, there are a minimum of 120 scientific um, studies that have to be done under good laboratory practices. And if you happen to be interested in registering an aquatic herbicide, or an algicide, something that's going to be used in waters, then the price of poker goes up and it's more like 150 different studies. And it, it, you know, in a separate exercise or when we have more time, um, I would pass out um, a, a list of all the studies. I mean, they're in the Code of Federal Regulations. You can pull it up yourself and take a look. These are not just, uh, oral toxicity and dermal toxicity and that sort of thing. These are very complex studies that have to be done and done under good laboratory practices. Uh, there are exceptions. In 1978, the EPA listed these exceptions to um, the misuse. You know, we know what uses are. We were enforcing misuse, which was a violation of Section 12A2G, 
But then in 1978, Congress listed these things as not being misuses. So you can mix pesticides and pesticides. You can add adjuvants and surfactants and spreader stickers and penetrating agents and what all the drift control agents. And uh, you can mix different pesticides together. You have to be pretty careful to make sure that that tank mix has got the right application rate when the product goes out but it's not illegal to mix them. And uh, you can mix fertilizers with pesticides and put them out at the same time. Uh, you see that sometimes, especially in large um, agricultural situations where you have selective um, pesticides being put out and you can kill two birds with one stone, no pun intended. You, you can use less than the label rate. <coughs> Uh, and that's not illegal as long as the site is on the label and you follow all the other directions for use. The risk, of course, is that uh, you're going to get less than optimal pest control and, and you may even get no pest control depending on how much less you choose to use. But it's it's not illegal. It's your responsibility, though. You can't go to the company um, or EPA and say, hey, I use less than the recommended label rates and I didn't get any control, um, that's on you. That's sort of what certification is all about, is to teach you some of the things you need to uh, watch and be careful about. And there's another risk to less than the label rate, and uh, we never thought we'd see it in aquatics, but we we are seeing it, and that's resistance. When you're using less than the label rates, you're actually accelerating resistance. Um, those of you uh, that are that also are affiliated with mosquito control programs or uh, black fly programs or midges or whatever, um, you're probably more aware of the risk to um, resistance than others, but it's there nonetheless. Uh, you can use any method of application you want to put the pesticide out unless it's prohibited by the label uh, and as long as as long as you can do it and adhere to all the directions for use you know that one of the examples that I use uh, to describe this is um, uh, there's a, um, a product that's uh, nematicide it's used in agriculture and the directions for use say apply in a band application with directed spray toward the base of the plant. So, you know, just being objective, when you look at that direction for use, you can sort of picture a tractor and a boom and the nozzles um, angled toward the base of the plant, spraying the side of the furrow, um, maybe for uh, nematis, uh, nematode control, or even herbicides. Some herbicides have that kind of direction on it. Um, well, obviously, you can't put that out by air. It just can't be done. You also can't use an airboat. You know, there, there's just, uh, there's any number of ways you could do it besides a tractor. You can do it with a backpack sprayer or a hand B&G gun that you use uh, to put insecticides out around your house, those kinds of things. But you have to look at the whole uh, label because some prohibitions are expressed, like only use the method of application identified on this label, or it can be applied, which would be what I just described, use only a directed spray. You can also use um, any registered pesticides to control any pest you want to, but again, it's at your own risk. Uh, the companies will list the target pest that they have tested for and that they're confident that their product will work on, but if um, if you decide to go off target, uh, off label, then that's on you. But I mean, there are a lot of situations back in the day when I just started getting into aquatics, uh, plants like Brazilian pepper. I was in Florida for 15 years as an inspector and uh, Brazilian pepper was uh, fairly, just really getting established and starting to go crazy. And there were very, very few products that had Brazilian pepper on them. But there were a lot of products that worked. 
So the applicator could take that risk as long as the site of application was on the label and also didn't exceed any label rates, followed all the safety instructions and so on. That's not illegal. Now I need to qualify these four things that they're not illegal according to the federal statute. Some states can be more restrictive and I know New Jersey does not allow less than the label rate and they may not even allow any of these two EEs. It's, it's your responsibility to check that and make sure that you're in compliance with the state requirements as well as the federal requirements. Uh, states can be more restrictive and I think uh, outside the western region the northeast has the most states so I didn't go to the trouble to look up uh, how many states in the northeast uh, do not recognize these two EE exceptions. So please make sure you're in compliance with state requirements when you do this. Now I'm gonna move pretty fast here on this storage. That was one of the things Bo Burns asked me to specifically cover. And it's a very difficult uh, thing. Um, I've got some pretty crappy images here. I, I got permission from the University of Florida to um, to use some of their images and in the transfer, I did a crappy job of, of uh, picking them out. So you'll see there's a lot of fuzziness in this next back, batch of uh, photographs. So these are just recommendations. Um, unless your state has specific requirements, the, probably North Carolina has the most specific requirements for pesticide storage. And so I recommend again that you please check with your state regulatory agency and see if they have any specific requirements. These are the kind of things I looked for when I was uh, an inspector and I would inspect a facility or an applicator. Um, Essentially, you want something separate, a build, separate building or certainly a separate area uh, within a larger building you want away from where the administration uh, area is, where office people are located. You, want, you don't want pesticide folks uh, or you don't want your employees exposed unnecessarily to leaks or anything like that. The ideal is a separate facility. Outside of that, you want a separate area with clear um, exhausts and that sort of thing. Needs signage. OSHA has specific signs that they recommend. Um, absent uh, an OSHA requirement, then as long as you have plenty of signage up to identify that this is pesticide area. SARA Title III, another statute, requires certain requirements as far as labeling and SDS sheets be available to first responders in the event of a fire or some sort of environmental catastrophe. So you wanna make sure you're in compliance with SARA Title III. You wanna to watch to make sure that uh, your storage area is dry and that there's some way to control temperature. There are, Depending on the specific pesticide, every pesticide has got a storage and disposal area on the label. You want to be sure that the products you use in the in your business um, is in compliance, that you look at that storage and disposal area, and especially in terms of temperature, there are low temperature limits and there's high temperature. Um, there's uh, I think there's a mosquito product, it, it's Fifanon, which is an active ingredient, Malathion, it has a high end. It's like, do not store with a temperature, and I'm, I know I'm gonna screw this up, but let's just say for the sake of argument, it's 90 degrees. Uh, well, if it's in a tank in Florida, in the middle of July, that tank outside in a storage area is going to get hotter than 90 degrees. If it's stored in the warehouse, just make sure there are fans and that sort of thing. If there are low end requirements on the storage and disposal statement, you wanna make sure there's some sort of heat to keep that product at a minimum temperature. Adequate lighting, you'd think you wouldn't have to say that, but the, one of the first things I did when I 
was an inspector, I'd go into the storage area and I'd want to see what it looked like uh, because it basically was a reflection on the business itself. You know, how um, how careful were they to store their chemicals? How uh, neat were they? How clean was the area? And how bright it was, you know, that it's easy to see the products. That minimizes mixing up chemicals. Um, there needs to be decontamination equipment outside of the storage area. You want to, if there's something that needs decontaminated, you want to get it outside the storage area. And a, uh, an inventory, that's also required by Sarah Title III. So you want to be sure you have that. So this is uh, Renovate 3. This is most of their storage and disposal um, statement that's on, on their label. Uh, there is a second paragraph that is for um, containers, uh, non-refillable containers, uh, five gallons or more. Uh, but it basically is uh, very similar to this. And this tells you, here's one, pesticide storage, store above 28 degrees Fahrenheit. That's rarely a problem in Georgia or Florida, but I bet right now it's kind of chilly up in your area. So how's your storage area? Is it is it heated at all? You know, those are the kinds of things you think about. Don't answer out loud in case there is a state inspector listening to this. But it, some of this is fairly standard language that EPA requires for all pesticides. But some of it specifically you know, that CPRO puts on here for particular reasons. So you look at it and you see, do not, this is one thing that's all over pesticide labels. There is advisory language and there's mandatory language. Anything that is an affirmative direction uh, or order, do not, you must, you have to, any of those kind of uh, words, uh, should call attention to you that you have to do it. It means that there's no leeway. On the other hand, you may have, here you got offer for recycling if available. Well, and, or it gives you options there. You can choose what you want to do. And you see that all, all through a pesticide label, that there are things that they, it is a lot of information and the manufacturer gives you choices on occasion. On other occasions, there's no choice. So that's what an inspector's looking for. They're looking for, are you adhering to all the do nots and do's that are on a pesticide label? Uh, it's um, almost impossible to comply with everything, but you can do it. And you, that should be your objective, that you're going to make sure that your employees or your colleagues are adhering to all these things. This time of year, there's not a lot of aquatic applications going on in your area. There's downtime. Uh, this is when you ought to be looking at the labels. You know what products you're going to be using next year. Sit out and go through them with all the employees. And, and highlight, you can get specimen labels off the internet or you can get them from your suppliers. And just highlight, just like this, highlight the do's and do nots, and then make sure you are following those directions for use. So these are the crappy pictures. I apologize up front for them. Oh, not these, these are pretty good. This is um, Melbourne Tillman, water um, drainage district in Florida. It's a series of canals that um, Florida, they have special districts that manage canals for agriculture and for flood control. And this was a number of years ago, maybe 15 years ago, they built this storage facility according to, I believe it was Corps of Engineers specs. Not enforceable, not required, but they wanted to get the best they could. So this is um, this is their facility. If you look on the right, that there's a, it's raised, the floor is raised, so that in the event of, a, um, I should say, the unlikely event of a spill, then um, it's gonna go down to that uh, subfloor and then it can be rinsed out and decontaminated. And there's their outside decontamination area and water source. 
And uh, on the left top there, that's just a storage in a, uh, in a warehouse where they also keep their airboats. And it, you know, it's just neat, separated, there it is. Um, everything's tidy. And then the other two pictures, the one on the right and the one on the bottom are um, inside that storage facility. On the right, you see there's an exhaust fan. When the door opens, it automatically turns on that exhaust fan. The ideal would be that that fan would be um, turned on and off by temperature, and that should be adjustable. Light sources, ideally, again, would be explosion proof. They're sealed. Uh, they're not that expensive anymore. They used to be, um, but all your outlets should be protected. In the event that there's leakage or there's some exhaust coming off uh, where there might be flammable products, um, that's what that's there for, to prevent someone walking in, flipping the light switch, and then having an explosion in their face. So it's an it's a good recommendation, something for you to think about if your budget uh, this coming year includes uh, developing some sort of storage facility. Uh, this was the sign that they ordered, had made up. Uh, they didn't know I was coming. And uh, so they just, as I drove into the uh, parking lot, uh, they were running around like somebody had kicked over a fire ant mound and um, somebody leaned the sign up there. Uh, as I said, OSHA has some recommended signage, easy to get, just Google it, uh, Google uh, pesticide storage and sign, and that'll come up and you can look at it. They're easy to obtain. I think Granger is an outlet that has it, but most of your pesticide distributors uh, should be able to help you with sign it. Here's the crappy photographs, I apologize. Um, you'd be surprised to know how often as an inspector, I ran into this kind of thing. Um, in, you may or may not have heard, like in the late 90s, there were some parathion cases where, um, that's where a lot of my criminal cases came from. And these were people that were getting methylparathion, pouring them into uh, things like uh, Snapple bottles um, and selling them in the back of their truck to people. And it just was not unusual. I'd, uh, the first suicide I ran into was Paraquat was in a Coca-Cola bottle. Paraquat is, is a deep, dark brown, almost black. Back then it was anyways. And in a Coca-Cola bottle, it just, uh, it wasn't an accident, but you could see how that could easily happen. So you keep your pesticides in the original container. Uh, we saw everything from Crown Royal bottles to Colt 45 uh, bottles with a sprayer on the top of it. Um, uh, we saw uh, emulsifiable concentrates uh, diluted with water and, uh, and being sold in milk jugs. And of course it looked like milk with the emulsifiable concentrate, um, not good. So if you see something like this as an inspector, that is a definite reflection on the company itself. Uh, make sure your company uh, storage area doesn't look like that. Empty containers, probably your state has some requirement or some option for you for empty containers. Um, I was playing golf one time. I had given a presentation at the Central Florida Golf Course Association meeting. And afterwards we played golf and uh, I was teeing off and I looked at the garbage can and the garbage can uh, was pretty much like this, except it didn't have the lid on it. And uh, it was right next to the tee box and it still had the pesticide label on it. And it's just like, oh, come on, don't, don't rub my nose in it. At least be, <laughs> take the damn label off if you're gonna, if you're gonna be that brazen. But it just, it's just, people have a hard time getting rid of good containers. But if you look at the, at the label, it says recycle or tri triple rinse, puncture, and then burn, bury, or recycle. So whatever the label says is what has to be done. 
Um, for the most part, you don't in aquatics, you don't see triple or speed rinse. These things here are designed to penetrate the container and it's attached to a hose. You can see the connector down at the bottom on both of these. Um, it's real sharp. You poke the poke it into the container and then you do the trigger and you can rinse that for really a few seconds almost and it's the equivalent of triple rinsing and EPA recognizes that. So then you're performing two things there. You're actually puncturing the container and you're triple rinsing it. Aquatic folks need to do that on site if you can. Um, obviously you're not going to have a hose out there with uh, connected to municipal water so most often it's triple rinsed right there at the application site. Many states have state recycling centers and areas where pesticide containers can be stored at the facility and then uh, trucks come by and pick them up. You see this quite a bit in cotton growing areas where there are a lot of pesticides being used and in like two and a half gallon, one gallon containers. And uh, most of the states in the South have this recycling thing. And, you know, they have programs that either are done by prisoners or wherever, it doesn't matter. Make sure that you're doing what you can to recycle these containers. Uh, excess mixtures, I just don't see that much in uh, aquatics. You want to, if you have any, you want to be sure it's put out before you bring the boat in, that it's put out on site. Make sure your mix is according to uh, the area that you're treating. You do that computation before you ever load it up. And then once you get your tanks filled out, you know that for the area you're gonna be treating, that entire tank has to be used and make sure you use it all. Same thing with excess product. You just wanna be sure you don't have these partially uh, filled drums laying around for a hundred years. Um, move it, get it to somebody who will use it. That's the best way to dispose of excess product. Um, rinse water. I put this picture in here because of the drain. If you look at the drain, the, the an inspector is going to say, where does that go to? In Michigan last year, uh, the state environmental agency, which also regulates there's a Department of Agriculture regulates pesticide use, but there's an um, environmental agency that looks at hazardous waste. So they were actually inspecting facilities and asking where does the rinse down water? Whenever you rinse off your boats, when you rinse off your spray rigs, where does that rinse water go? And in this case, um, one case that I was involved in, uh, the drain actually went to a uh, an area behind the building that was a wetland and they sampled the outflow and came up with copper and um, a variety of other compounds that uh, degrade very slowly and there was a fairly substantial fine involved and uh, the company was responsible for the cleanup so if you do clean your equipment at a place like this, be sure you know where that's going and you do have some process whereby you monitor that to make sure you're not creating a hazardous waste site. Uh, same thing goes with spills and leaks. When you clean up a spill or a, a leak from a pump or a hose, you, you know, not only is the, the chemical to be disposed of, properly but all your cleanup material any clothes that might have been contaminated all those have to be disposed of uh, uh, properly so from an enforcement standpoint with storage and disposal all these things are flags that inspectors going to see and say well what are, what is this and what do you do with it what where 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 are the lids for these containers um, what do you do with these old drums, these empty bags? Why are they laying around? A good inspector is going to go out and look in the dumpster, whether you take them there or not, because they're going to look at if it was a, an inspection by appointment, if they had to call ahead. I, every state's a little bit different on that. 
we never called ahead. We just showed up and ruined your day. But some some states do call ahead, and often that'll call for a rush to the dumpster with all kinds of stuff that are laying around because they've heard me uh, talk before. So they're cleaning up stuff, throwing it in the dumpster. Well, an inspector's going to look to see what's in there. An inspector's going to look for spills inside and outside, and they're going to go around and look uh, around the property and make sure everything looks uh, satisfactory. I definitely recommend you inspect your own operation. You can get state inspection forms by just calling the lead agency for pesticides, and it varies. Uh, up north, it's often the environmental agency. It's DEC, I think, in New York. Um, but you also have other states. I think Massachusetts and New Hampshire have ag inspectors. Um, you want to be sure that uh, you, you might want somebody else to ask for them so they don't have your address. Uh, if this were live, I would expect to get a laugh out of that. Uh, or you can design your own form. And what you look for are all the directions for use that appear on a pesticide label. Just pull some labels up and look at them. You know, and, and each one of those labels is going to have stuff like this on it. And make sure that that your facility is in compliance with all this. You know, for example, if a pesticide label requires a certain kind of personal protective equipment for your employees or your colleagues or you, well, do you have it? Do you even have it? I mean, that's that's an easy one for an inspector to see. You know, you look at the label and you're supposed to wear, let's say, a Tyvek suit, chemical resistant gloves and shoes, uh, and um, a face shield. Well, do you have those items? The inspector should immediately turn around and say, well, let me see your safety equipment. And you don't want to be shown, as an inspector, you don't want to be shown something that looks like uh, it's been, um, uh, washed and ironed that morning before you showed up. You want to see, is it really available? Is Are the boats equipped with this stuff? Or do you check out? What's your policy? What's your procedure? All of that sort of thing are things that you can do yourself before an inspector ever shows up. Um, also, commercial applicators have to maintain records of pesticide use. It varies state by state. Um, you know, any one of you could probably give a better presentation on records than I can. The feds are mostly interested in um, restricted use pesticides. And if you have any of those, uh, you use any of those, you need to be sure you're in compliance with all of the information that's required to be kept. I want to um, highlight this, labels change. They change fairly frequently. It used to be you could look at a Roundup label. Well, of course, Roundup used to be just glyphosate. It's not anymore. You go to Home Depot or Lowe's and look at the Roundup brand, and you're going to see different active ingredients other than glyphosate. Glyphosate's still there, of course, but Roundup is a brand name. It's not a uh, doesn't reflect what chemical is in that product. It's like the old ortho products that you might have used around your home years ago. It might have a fungicide, insecticide, herbicide, disinfectant, it, who knows? It's just the ortho brand. And in this case, that's the way Monsanto's going, or Bayer, and that they are going to the Roundup brand for homeowners. So labels change, they change sometimes Years ago, the, the the old Roundup label had a little booklet on the side of it, glued to the side of the container. When you pull that off and look at it, it would say 2021-4. And that meant that was the fourth iteration of that booklet in that year. Now, what what had changed? I don't know. Something significant, maybe. Um, why didn't the company let us know? It's not their obligation. It's your obligation to read the label before applying it. That's what the, that's what it says. So it's your responsibility to make sure that the labels have not changed in a way that puts you at risk. On off times, rainy days, snow days up there, 
these days, winter days, these are the days you ought to be looking at those labels, as I indicated before. Make sure they're okay. Also, identical active ingredients do not equate to identical directions for use. This is one of the most frequent catches that inspectors run into. A company will find the same active ingredient on a product that may be used for agriculture instead of aquatics, and the price is significantly lower per gallon. Uh, so that's what they use. Well, it's the same thing. Well, it's not the same thing. If it doesn't have aquatic directions for use on it, it's not to be used in aquatics. And if you use it, that's a misuse, and you're liable for it, and you're certified, you know better. So that's the kind of thing that an inspector is going to watch for. So what's the worst that can happen? Well, these are just EPA numbers. So for civil pesticide misuse, the max is $7,500 per offense. So if you're caught at the end of the year doing something that you've done all year, every application that can be documented could be as high as $7,500. Uh, NPDS violations, you know, one would, these would be violation of the waters of the U.S. Uh, definition or a permit violation, they can be as high as $3,700 a day um, per day. So that's significantly worse than civil pesticide penalties. And criminal cases, those are misdemeanors according to the law, but that's significant. That's a year in jail and uh, between a $25,000 and $50,000 fine. I've had eight uh, criminal cases where people went to jail. And it's, you know, it's not a, it's fun to do the investigations. I don't wanna um, lie to you, but it's not fun to sit there and watch someone being handcuffed and led away and leaving their family in the in the courtroom. So it's not a pleasant thing at all, and especially for the person that got led away. So practical. Here's here's a, a turf herbicide. It's uh I think it's a 2,4-D product. Uh it this is just I grabbed this. Uh, it's an old uh, slide. You can see it's starting to get a little fuzzy. But I wanted to point this out because some of these directions for use, you can't take for granted that they're the same across the board. This is exactly the kind of thing that would uh, maybe prompt a, uh, a complaint from a homeowner. So a pest control company or a lawn and turf company comes out and they uh, treat the lawn with this product. Um, and there's a complaint. Some let's just make something up that uh, all the hair fell off the legs of the of the homeowner's dog, and so they're complaining. And they saw something on 60 Minutes that had to do with um, Agent Orange. So they're oh my God, they they put Agent Orange out on my lawn. What am I gonna do? Are my kids safe? Blah, blah, blah. Those are the kind of calls that you get as a pesticide inspector. So as an inspector, I'm gonna talk to the applicator after I talk to the homeowner, and I'm gonna ask him questions like, well, what protective equipment did you wear? What rate did you apply? How did you mix the product? All of those questions are asked up front, and then we go look at the label. And so here's uh, for non-worker protection uses, you can see that the requirements when mixing, loading, or applying this product, long sleeve shirt, uh, long pants, socks, shoes, and chemical resistant gloves. There's no requirement to wear respiratory protection or eye protection. So you have to have used at least this, this level of uh, protective clothing. Well, okay, and then further on, Notice it's a re-entry statement. Now, re-entry statements, generally speaking, are for worker protection. And, and uh, lawn and turf and aquatic folks uh, do not fall under the worker protection standard. But nonetheless, this is non-agricultural use requirement. There still is a re-entry statement. It says, do not, notice that's, that's an affirmative direction. Do not allow people other than the applicator or pets on the treatment area during application. And then do not enter the treatment area until spray has dried. Now it doesn't tell you how to 
how to do that, especially the second sentence. How do you keep people off of it? How do you keep the homeowner and uh, pets and children off that treated area? Are you going to sit there and wait till it dries and then drive away? So the question that would be asked by an inspector is, what did you do? So clearly, there isn't something specific that you have to do. The inspector's not looking for, oh, I put a door hanger on the on the knob. I posted the lawn with signs. They're not looking for something like that. They just want to know, what did you do? What's a rational, reasonable act action that you did to comply with this uh, direction for use? And then when we ask, well, how did you mix it? Well, sometimes, you know, you just add the chemical, then you add water, and you fill up the tank, and you go from there. And these are the kind of questions that when an inspector asks a, an applicator, how did you mix this product? They just throw up the answer because they do it so often, they know exactly what they did. Well, the inspector then looks at this label and says, well, did you do this? Look here, it says add one half of the required amount of water, then add this speed zone slowly with agitation. So, you know, the question, are you even able to agitate the product in your tank? Uh, then you complete filling it to prevent separation, thoroughly mix and continue agitation while spraying. So those are the kind of questions the, app, the inspector is gonna be asking. And uh, hopefully the applicator has read the label, is familiar with it and can answer those questions. And then notice down at the bottom, do not use tank additives that alter the pH of the spray solution. You're seeing uh, buffering instructions and things like that uh, more and more frequently on agricultural, uh, I'm sorry, on aquatic herbicide labels because the water your treatment can adversely impact the success of your treatment if you're not considering things like the pH or the hardness of the water. So those are things that you wanna look at, make sure your label has those instructions and that you're complying. So I've got 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna run through these real quick. This is an old group of slides. And years ago, um, you know, when I was you know, still doing field work, um, I'd, I'd talk to people and say, well, what did you use? And I'd just hear, well, I use copper. I just use copper. And, and they, contrary to herbicides, like if I ask them, well, uh, what kind of herbicide did you use? They would tell me the brand. You know, they just say, oh, I, I used, um, or the active ingredient, you know, I used endothal or I used um, rodeo or I used whatever. But when it came to copper, they almost always just grouped them all together as copper. So I walked through the exhibit area and these, these labels, some of them don't exist anymore. There's been buyouts and combinations and some folks have probably gone out of business. Uh, I know at least one of those products doesn't live anymore. And Captain is now Captain XTR, but it doesn't matter for the purposes of this, this exercise. These products did exist. They were registered EPA uh, algicides and they were all of them, uh, examples of them in the exhibit area of an aquatic meeting that I was attending at the time. So we look at them real quick. So uh, here's copper sulfate. I go from the highest percentage of active ingredient down to the lowest. So here's 99%. Now signal word is danger. Now you got three signal words. You've got uh, caution, warning, and danger. Caution is the uh, least toxic. So your risk is lowest with a signal word of uh, caution. Well, this is danger, this is the worst. This is as bad as it gets. And look at the PPE requirements, shirt, pants, waterproof gloves, shoes and socks, and eyewear. So that's it. Doesn't say NASA moon suit or anything else. So let's go to the next one. Current, 31%. I'm not sure that one even exists anymore. Um, it might. Signal word, Caution, all right, so one third of the active ingredient and you go from danger to caution. Okay, precautions, avoid contact. I mean, what the hell? You mean you don't have to wear any protective clothing at all? You just, what, keep moving around? Doesn't matter, just make sure you avoid contact. 
Look at the next one, 24% harpoon. So the word caution, same thing, avoid contact. Here we go, 15.9%. Signal word danger. Holy crap. You keep going down and down what I don't know what the percentage of that is, below 99. And here the it's danger. I and but you only have to wear eyewear. F30, uh 10.9%. And I'm sure this is all different now, these these labels because EPA is change the definition of how you figure out how much copper's in it and all that sort of thing. But keep in mind, that's not important for this exercise. This is just what did the label say at that time? So 10.9% uh, caution, do not. That meant, you know, do not come in contact with it. Here we go, nine, Q chain plus, 9%, still going down. Holy crap, back up the danger. But all you gotta wear are gloves and eyewear. You could be naked. As long as you had gloves and eyewear on, you're okay. Here's uh, q train Ulta, 9% danger. Oh yeah, but for this product, you have to wear shirt, pants, gloves, uh, shoes and socks, and eyewear. Uh, combing, 8%, caution, avoid contact. Again, now what? You can see there's no consistency here if you just look at these three criteria. Uh, symmetry, uh, active ingredient 8%. Now, signal words of warning, halfway between danger and caution. You gotta wear a waterproof gloves and a NIOSH approved respirator. That's the first time that's popped up and look, you're down to 8%. Act, here's algemiacin, uh, PWF, active ingredient 5%. Signal word caution, you're back down to sh shirt, pants, waterproof gloves, shoes, socks, and eyewear. Holy crap, what PPE should I wear? Well, read the damn label. That's what it comes down to. Why would an 8% product require a danger sign along with a 99% active ingredient? And yet, uh, a 10% product just be a caution. I don't know. And chances are you don't know either. It could be the chelating agent. It could be um, some uh, some emulsifier, something that's in there to help it go into solution. Some uh, inert ingredients. It has its own level of toxicity that you got to be careful about. It, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You don't need to know how to make this stuff in a lab in order to use it properly. All you have to do is read the damn label. It tells you what um, you know what PPE you need to wear and how to be safe when you apply this product. So here's uh, one of my favorite philosophers, Orifice P. Nozzlehead, and these are words that uh, you could teach your children. You know, never ever take a sleeping pill and a laxative at the same time. That's really important. And this is an actual sign that was on a golf course in Arkansas. I had done some training of inspectors in Arkansas, and bless his heart, the inspector sent me this that he had he had located. Uh, the product was a fungicide that was used on a green. Uh, Chipco was the brand name, and then those are the comments. And uh, I think that's pretty good advice, no matter no matter where you are or who you are. And that is my presentation. So I don't know if anyone's here or <laughs> or who I've offended. I think 20 people have left after that last slide. But uh, I have just a couple minutes, Josh. If uh, there's a way to ask questions, I'd be happy to take any. Uh, I'm not seeing any, oh, one question. Um, thoughts on the glyphosate controversy? Uh, you, you, I have some thoughts. Uh, most of them aren't, uh, shouldn't be made public. Uh, I, I really recommend that you invite Jay Farrell or Stephen Enlow from the University of Florida uh, to give a presentation, even if you just like the board of NEA PMS just has a special event where people can call in and see it. They do about a, 
a 20 minute uh, presentation in PowerPoint that covers everything. Um, you know, the, the fact that, um, you know, the group that, that made, that called uh, glyphosate a probable carcinogen is the same group that has examined almost a thousand different products and only one product was not at least a probable carcinogen and that was um, the product that's used uh, the chemical that's used to make uh, stretchy yoga pants I, you sort of, it's a difference between risk and hazard and that sort of thing that's very subtle and uh, Jay and Stephen really does a great they both do a great job in defining that I don't put a lot of credit in it um, you know, now uh, paraclot's the next chemical in line that's been targeted. And, um, you know, t what are we in now? 40 years since the manufacturer of asbestos went bankrupt, they're still having asbestos case. Uh, so I don't know. It's, the, it's a reflection of how our society is with chemicals these days. Um, but, um, I don't put a lot of credence into that whole thing, especially after seeing those presentations. Oh. Um, well, I'm not seeing any others, so I'd like to thank you for your time. And for anybody on the webinar, head over to Gathertown for the remaining sections. Is uh, there a bar there, Josh? Uh, maybe there's a virtual bar somewhere. <laughs> oh. So. Thank, thank you again, Carlton. It was a it was a pleasure. My pleasure. I look forward to seeing everybody next year. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you.